the Rules Committee will come to order. Six days ago, this Capitol building and our very democracy came under attack, not from a foreign nation, but from within, from domestic terrorists acting at the behest of the President of the United States. They were determined to stop the very essence of our democratic process, Congress's work tallying the Electoral College results. All because after a free and fair election, Donald Trump came out on the losing side. He had been ginning up anger and conspiracy theories for months, he encouraged his supporters to come to a wild rally in Washington. And on January 6, 2021, his actions reached a dangerous new height. President Trump told his supporters during an angry 70 minute speech at the Ellipse to march down here to the United States Capitol. We are going to have to fight much, we are going to have to fight much harder, he told them. You will never take back our country with weakness. Mike Pence, he said, is going to have to come through for us. The president then told this mob to walk down to the Capitol. His remarks followed his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who called for, and I quote, trial by combat. And a member of this very institution who told the crowd, and I quote, today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass, end quote. The impact of these words is unmistakable. The president of the United States was encouraging a violent coup to try to hang on to power. The attackers did what the president suggested. They stormed the Capitol. They broke into offices, vandalized this complex, and they charged onto the Senate floor. They very nearly broke onto the House floor. They constructed a noose and a gallows, a stone's throw away from the Capitol steps, chanting to hang the Vice President of the United States. They had weapons and zip ties looking to hold members hostage or worse. Five people lost their lives that day, including a Capitol Police officer. I won't go into every gruesome detail here. We were all there. We lived it. I'll never forget when I looked into the eyes of the rioters, I, I saw evil. We all experienced that fear for not only for ourselves, but for our staff, uh, for the Capitol Police, um, for all those who work here, from the people who work in the cafeteria to the people who work in, in the parliamentarian's office. We were fearful for them and we were fearful for our nation. The question is, what are we gonna do about it? What will Congress do about a sitting president of the United States encouraging domestic terrorists to attack elected officials and stop democracy in its tracks? To do nothing, to pretend that this was just another bizarre day in a bizarre presidency is, no, is not an option. Some on the other side have talked about unity. Well, we can't have unity without truth and without accountability. Others have suggested we should just move on, but that's exactly what Congress should not do. Our democracy is under siege and the threat resides at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We all took the same oath just a few days ago. We vowed to protect and defend this nation from all enemies, foreign and, and domestic. We are being called to fulfill that oath, oath today. Every moment Donald Trump spends in the White House puts our nation at risk. Just today, Trump made clear that he doesn't understand the consequences of his words and actions. After everything that happened, after all that happened on that terrifying day, after people died, he still doesn't grasp his responsibility for all of this. Now, it was just reported that even the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, has told associates that he believes Trump committed impeachable offenses. And he's reportedly glad that we are moving forward with impeachment. Now, some of my Republican colleagues ask, what's the damage of a Trump presidency, presidency for a few more days? Now, just think of what this president can do. He could pardon these domestic terrorists if he wanted to. I don't know what, I mean, I, I mean, he could basically wipe the slate clean for all these people who desecrated the United States Capitol building, who, who killed 
a Capitol Hill police officer who God knows harmed, I don't know how many people, and it's threatening to come back. Each day we are more and more disgusted by his actions. Understand that Donald Trump is a clear and present danger, and we need to address the real fear that he, start, that he starts more unrest. We can't wait. We must defend our democracy, and we must hold Trump accountable for his words and their deadly consequences. Now let me turn to the ranking member for any comments that he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today is indeed a very sad day for all of us. For the second time in 13 months, we're meeting to discuss the impeachment of the President of the United States. The gravity of this occasion should give us all pause. Certainly the tumult of last week is weighing heavily on all our minds and souls. Last week, as Congress was meeting to certify the results of the 2020 presidential election, rioters violently stormed the Capitol building. Over the next several hours, chaos reigned. What started out as peaceful protests ended in violence, resulting in six deaths, including those of two courageous Capitol Police officers. And what should have been a ceremonial function of the legislative body turned into an unimaginable tragedy. I cannot condemn the violence that occurred last Wednesday strongly enough. Every single perpetrator who entered the Capitol building intent on doing harm and causing mayhem should be brought to justice and those who committed lawless and violent acts should face the fullest and harshest punishment available under the law. After last Wednesday's traumatic and difficult events, our priority should be to find ways to come together. In a week, we will be observing and celebrating the inauguration of a new president, demonstrating that the peaceful transition of power, a tradition that's occurred at the end of every presidency since George Washington, will still proceed. In this manner, America serves as a beacon of freedom and democracy for the entire world. But instead of looking forward, the majority is today looking backward. I understand the anger and emotion all members feel after the events of last Wednesday. And yes, the president does bear some responsibility for what occurred. Certainly, he will have to deal with the ramifications of Wednesday's events for the rest of his life. But I differ with my colleagues uh, in the majority in that I do not believe their proposed course of action, impeachment, is the appropriate solution. I can think of no action the House can take that is more likely to further divide the American people than by putting the country through the trauma of another impeachment. As I speak today, we're just eight days from the end of President Trump's term of office. Next week, President-elect Biden will take the oath of office as the President of the United States. At a time like this, we should be seeking a path forward uh, healing, or a path toward healing the American people. But instead, the majority is rushing to judgment without due process. The reason for this is clear. We are just eight days to the end of President Trump's term. But in rushing to impeach the president before he leaves office, the majority is abrogating the procedural considerations that have been the hallmark of every modern impeachment proceeding except this one. In moving ahead now, the majority is foregoing an investigation, committee hearings, fact witnesses, and expert witnesses. They are foregoing an opportunity for members to ask questions, to review the evidence, to hear new pieces of evidence, and to consult with experts on impeachment and the Constitution. And they are foregoing an opportunity for the president, as accused, to be heard, not because his reckless words are deserving of a defense, but because the president itself uh, demands due process in impeachment proceedings. Failing to utilize the historical and constitutional process we have used in the past and rushing to the floor makes this what Professor Jonathan Turley calls a, quote, dangerous snap impeachment, unquote. A snap impeachment without due process and without due consideration will not help bring the American people together, as our focus should be, and it is a great disservice to the institution and to the country. But to make matters worse, a snap impeachment like this also does not give members the opportunity to appropriately consider this course of action and put it into context. I know the majority believes the case for the impeachment is obvious, but I'm not convinced that is true, and I know a large number of members who feel as I do. There's a range of opinions about the president's conduct last week. And given those differences, I believe the appropriate course of action to take is to actually have a process. 
we should be considering these allegations, discussing them, working them through with experts, and coming to a decision. Without taking that course, there will be no consensus on this matter, and the consequences of that may be dire. Moreover, some believe uh, that this process is so rushed that it will inevitably lead to uh, doubts about its fairness. The simple fact of the matter is that there's no reason to rush ahead like this other than the impending end of the president's term. The Senate cannot even take up a trial of the president until 1 p.m. on January the 20th at the earliest, one hour after President-elect Biden takes office. And when it gets there, Senator, Senator Manchin has said that he does not believe there are sufficient votes to hit the two-thirds threshold for conviction. Majorities rushing toward uh, uh, forward on a course with no clear end and no predictable conclusion. Mr. Chairman, I think we need to take a deep breath and think about this more clearly. We've all been through a terrible trauma, but we need to recognize that what we're considering today is the result of a flawed process. House action today will not bring the country together. Instead, it will ensure that the transition to a new presidency is clouded with the uncertainty of a hastily executed impeachment. I deeply regret that this is the course uh, the majority has chosen. I think there are better alternatives available to us, including bipartisan options that an overwhelming majority of the House could stand behind. There's also time to choose a different path, one that leads to reconciled divisions and brighter, dead, uh, brighter days ahead. Uh, there are, Mr. Chairman, a variety of legislative tools that could bring us together as opposed to tear us apart. I hope we choose that path. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his comments. And I, let, me, let me just say, um, this is a bipartisan option. And I, um, I'm looking at a statement from the Republican Conference Chair, Liz Cheney. And let me quote her, um, what she said. She says, uh, much more will become clear in the coming days and weeks. But what we, do, what we know now is enough. The President of the United States summoned his, his, this mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Everything that followed was his doing. None of this would have happened without the president. The president could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence. He did not. There has never been a greater betrayal by a president of the United States of his office and his oath to the Constitution. And I have statements here as well by Adam Kinzinger and, uh, and John Katko, all of who have joined in this effort to impeach the president. Look, at I think what can unite this country is a huge bipartisan vote uh, in favor of impeachment. Let us end this. Let us all distance. Everybody should distance themselves from the actions uh, of this president. Um, you know, I think that is what is, uh, and I'm going to ask you, as I said, to insert their statements in the record. Um, I am now happy to uh, acknowledge our witnesses here today. Uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, and the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, we're delighted you're here. Um, this is a very serious matter. Without any objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. I'm now happy to yield to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the House Rules Committee. We're here today to consider a resolution of impeachment because the President of the United States poses an ongoing and current threat to the well being of the American people to our democracy, and to the national security of the United States. For several months, he has fed the American people baseless lies that he won re-election last November. The president has fueled rage among his supporters and turned some Americans into domestic terrorists. He directed his supporters to come to Washington to stop the peaceful transfer of power and overturn the results of a free and fair election. For several hours, this violent mob ransacked the Capitol and brought the joint session of Congress to a halt delaying the counting of the electoral vote. We later found that the rioters' plan was to hang the vice president, assassinate the Speaker of the House, and hunt down individual members of Congress. In the end, five Americans were killed, including a United States Capitol Police officer who was beaten with the pole of an American flag. Dozens were injured, and serious damage was done to the Capitol. It is clear the President of the United States incited this insurrection, which is clearly an impeachable offense. He has had almost a week to do the right thing. 
He has refused to resign. He has failed to take responsibility. He has demonstrated no remorse. Vice President Mike Pence, for his part, has also so far refused to invoke the 25th Amendment. We have been left with no other option than to consider the second impeachment of Donald J. Trump. None of us wants to be in this room today. Instead of preparing for the inauguration of a new president, we have new fences surrounding the Capitol, thousands of National Guard troops protecting the nation's capital, and every day we learn about new threats to our democracy. That is why today, with the support of 217 of our colleagues, I have the solemn responsibility to present for your consideration House Resolution 24 and the accompanying report relating to the impeachment of Donald John Trump, President of the United States, for high crimes and misdemeanors. We must act now to remove President Trump from office. For a moment, let's go back to the events of the morning of Wednesday, January 6th. Pursuant to the 12th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Vice President of the United States, the House of Representatives, and the Senate prepared to gather at the United States Capitol for a joint session of Congress to count the votes of the Electoral College. This is the moment when hundreds of millions of votes are counted and the peaceful transition of power begins. This is a sacred ritual of our democracy. Less than two miles away at the ellipse, a different gathering was underway. Thousands of President Trump's most diehard supporters gathered as a result of the president's calling people to Washington. Shortly after Congress began to carry out its constitutional duty, a violent mob stormed the Capitol building armed with guns, bats, shields, zip ties, and chemical spray. Some were clothing, were clothing promoting the QAnon conspiracy. Others carried the battle flag of the Confederacy, a potent symbol of slavery, racism, and treason. There is no question that the insurrection at the Capitol was incited by the president. However, this is not just about what President Trump did on January 6th to incite the insurrection but also what he did in the months leading up to that fateful day. On December 19th, for example, he tweeted, and I quote, statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election. Big protest in DC on January 6th. Be there, we'll be wild. The report that has been submitted to the committee clearly lays out the case for impeachment and details a pattern of behavior by President Trump who has attempted for months to maintain power by subverting the will of the American people. After his loss to President-elect Biden, President Trump filed 62 frivolous lawsuits, raising baseless claims of election fraud, which were quickly rejected by the courts. He requested an investigation by the Department of Justice, which just as quickly closed its investigation into vote tabulation irregularities based on a lack of evidence. On December 23rd, President Trump called Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to request that he, quote, find, end quote, enough votes to reverse the Georgia presidential election results and threatened Mr. Raffensperger with criminal penalties if he failed to do so. In the run-up to last Wednesday's insurrection, President Trump also pressured Vice President Pence to reject the electoral votes of states he lost, a request the Vice President refused to do because doing so would have been illegal. Desperately running out of options, President Trump called on his supporters to fight for him. On January 1st, the president directed his supporters to come to Washington to rally for the express purpose of overturning the results of the November 2020 presidential election, tweeting, the big protest rally in Washington, D.C. will take place at 11 a.m. on January 6th. Location details to follow. Stop the steal. The day before the rally, he called on his supporters to step up and fight back. On January 6th, thousands of President Trump supporters gathered to attend the Save America rally at the Ellipse which is just south of the White House. That morning was his last dish attempt to maintain power and overturn the results of the presidential election. In the hours before the Save America rally, the president tweeted 12 times, continuing to spread false claims that the election was rigged and encouraging his supporters to fight and be strong. During the rally, several of President Trump's allies spoke in incendiary terms on his behalf, including his personal lawyer, Rudolph Giuliani, who said, let's have trial by combat. The president's son, Donald Trump Jr., warned Republican Congress members that if they did not support his father, quote, we're coming for you, end quote. President Trump was the last speaker at the rally. He continued to insist falsely that he had won the election in a landslide. He encouraged the crowd to fight much harder. President Trump attacked members of his own party, saying that you got to get rid of the weak Congress people, the ones that aren't any good, like Liz Cheney's of the world. And in a parting admonition to the crowd, he warned, and I quote, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore, end quote. President supporters took him at his word. We all witnessed what happened next. Thousands of angry, violent domestic terrorists stormed the Capitol building. They scaled walls, 
shattered windows, and left a path of destruction in their wake, defacing historic statutes, destroying monuments, and smearing their feces, blood, and urine throughout the halls of Congress. In the ensuing conflict, five people were killed, including a Capitol Police officer. Members of Congress, the Vice President, Congressional staff, and members of the press fled for their lives, and the joint session certifying the Electoral College results was delayed. Even when it was clear that things had gotten completely out of control, President Trump released a video on Twitter where he failed to denounce the attack. In fact, he told the rioters, and I quote, we love you, you're very special, end quote. Instead of lowering the temperature and trying to restore order, President Trump doubled down on his false claim, and he said, the election was stolen from us, it was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, end quote. Once again, the president has left us no choice. Congress must impeach the president immediately. The framers anticipated the exact circumstances that bring us here today. One of their chief concerns was to provide adequate safeguards to protect against corruption and preserve the integrity of the democratic process, especially our sacred elections. For this reason, the framers provided the House of Representatives with the sole power of impeachment and the Senate with the authority to conduct a trial where the president is afforded ample due process rights under the law. Separate and apart from these proceedings, the 14th Amendment recognizes that there must be accountability for anyone who has engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the people of the United States. By endangering Congress and the democratic process, President Trump violated his oath to the Constitution and threatened to topple the Republic. He incited the January 6th insurrection for one purpose, to maintain the presidency at all costs, despite the will of the American people. The president is a clear and present danger to our democracy and our national security. He must be removed from office immediately. It's clear to everyone that the violent attack on the Capitol was a direct result of the president's conduct, not only this past Wednesday, but also in the last few months. By encouraging a violent mob to storm the Capitol last Wednesday with the purpose of overturning the legitimate result of last November's presidential election, President Donald J. Trump did, in fact, commit high crimes and misdemeanors against the people of the United States. The world saw what happened last Wednesday at the United States Capitol. We were all here and witnessed it firsthand. I challenge anyone to tell me differently. It could not be more clear. In the days since, more and more evidence has emerged that the same people who carried out this assault are planning to do even worse. We cannot let them succeed. We must send a message to the American people that we will uphold our oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Last Wednesday, the President of the United States incited the insurrection at the citadel of our democracy, the United States Capitol. All of us here tonight have a responsibility to defend this sacred institution and our great democracy. And most importantly, we must preserve our great republic for all future generations. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his comments. I'm now uh, happy to yield to Mr. Armstrong from North Dakota. Welcome to the Rules Committee. I'm supposed to do. No. Last week, I took uh, what I thought was the only vote possible under the Constitution, and that was to seat our electors. And I'm proud of that vote. And I have taken incoming from lots of different places, as many of my colleagues have since then. So, um, and I'm proud, and I believe in the Constitution, and I believe in all of the Constitution. And that's why I'm here today. And it's because you don't heal America by dividing America. One week from now, Joe Biden will be the President of the United States. No one disputes that, and President Trump has called for the transition to happen. We all want and expect this transaction, transition to happen peacefully. Yet today, again, Democrats are trying to impeach the president. President Trump is leaving office in one week, and rather than allow this to happen, the Democrats can't resist one last opportunity to attack the president. Looking at the article of impeachments, it's easy to see why the Democrats don't want to have the due process needed. This article of impeachment charges President Trump with inciting the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol. And that word incitement is important because it's the threshold by which First Amendment activity is no longer protected. And it takes one line from the president's more than one hour, hour long speech and removes context to create an illusion that the president encouraged violence. That could be not further from the truth. Near the start of the president's comments, he said, I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Near the end of the president's speech, he said, we're going to walk down to the Capitol and we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. 
Incitement is not just a word. It is a legal standard that has been shaped by decades of Supreme Court cases. In the 1969 case of Brandenburg v. Ohio, the Supreme Court held that incitement is advocacy directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. Noted First Amendment scholar, Professor Eugene Volokh has concluded that President Trump's comments did not amount to incitement. He warned that we certainly shouldn't let outrage against Trump allow the distortion of the constitutional rule that protects speakers generally. Constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley similarly warned that Democrats would, not, would gut not only the impeachment standard, but also free speech, all in a mad rush to remove Trump just days before his term ends. Constitutional scholars Professor, jo Professor Josh Blackman and Seth Barrett Tillman have argued that if Trump's speech is, is protected by the First Amendment, Congress cannot impeach him for that conduct. The House should, should not ignore its precedent, historical process, and the law to set a new standard today. The people who file the articles want Americans to believe that Trump is an imminent threat to the country. But just a few days ago, a Democrat, a, Democrat membership, a Democrat in leadership said that if the House impeaches the president today, they may hold the articles and prevent the Senate from convening a trial until after President-elect Biden's first 100 days in office. If, it truly is, if they truly believe that President Trump is such an imminent threat to the country, why would they even consider waiting more than three months until he's no longer in office to send the articles to the Senate? And why is the inco is incoming president violated, president elect violated, advocating for half day trials in the Senate so that cabinet members can still be appointed? I've said this before, I'll say it again. What happened on the Capitol on January 6 was wrong. It is not what America is about. And I personally believe the president does bear some responsibility for that. I think his language was reckless and I think it was callous, but I don't think it rises to the level of incitement. I condemn the violence, the Republican conference condemns this violence, and we commend the brave, men, brave men and women of the Capitol Police and other law enforcement agencies who defended the Capitol that day. Those that were involved in this attack, attack must be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law, and the D Department of Justice is making progress in doing just that. We mourn and pray for those who lost their lives and were injured in last week's senseless violence. But our country faces deep partisan divisions, and there are significant challenges facing our nation. Now should be a time to bring Americans together and to, to do the work on behalf of the American people. And another attempt to remove this president does nothing to unify this nation. I urge all members to oppose. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, let, me, um, um, let, me, let me just say, um, did, did, did we all see the same video of the president's speech on Wednesday? Did we all witness the same mob descend on the Capitol, uh, saying that they were all here at the direction of the president? Uh, many of them thought the president was here. Uh, I mean, if, th if that's not the definition of incitement, I don't know what is. And by the way, that's just that is that's just one part of it. I mean, leading up to this you know, was a big lie that was told over and over and over and over again uh, that, uh, that, that, that this election was rigged, uh, that, it, uh, that, that it was fraudulent, that the president had won the election by a landslide. And people went along with it because they wanted to stay in the president's good graces. I mean, that is what the crowd came here about. And I'm, you know, and I'm just going to say, I'm going to, again, read the words of my colleague, Liz Cheney. I'm a liberal. She's a conservative. We don't agree on very much of, of anything. But I admire her integrity when it comes to this issue. Let me repeat it. She says, this is her quote, the president of the United States summoned this mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Everything that followed was his doing. None of this would have happened without the president. The president could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence. He did not. There has never been a greater betrayal by a president of the United States of his office, of, of his office and of his oath to the Constitution. She is right. She is right. I mean, there's no gray area here. There's none. And for those who want to just, you know, turn the other way. 
and say, well, you know, let's just let it go. Maybe people will forget. People should not forget what happened. There has to be a consequence. If there is not a consequence, this will happen again. This will happen again. Uh, so in any event, we will, I'm gonna make an announcement here. We, uh, we're in the middle of two votes. So um, I'm gonna, we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a brief recess so that we all can vote on both of these votes, the previous question and the rule. And, um, and once you're finished voting on the rule, then come back um, and we will continue this, uh, th this discussion. So without objection, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the chair.
to order. Um, I'm now, I'd like, now like to yield to uh, Dr. Burgess. Um, thank you, Mr. Govern. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Armstrong for joining us up here this evening. Um, it's good to see you up here. You, I, as part of your uh, opening remarks, you mentioned that this could be setting a new standard. And since impeachment is such an infrequent or historically has been such an infrequent activity, um, every decision this body makes is going to affect subsequent discussions of this activity throughout the course of history. It, I guess I was just struck by your your comments about the time frame involved and the rapidity with which this is um, being brought to the rules committee and subsequently to the floor. Um, I, I think I share your concern about setting a new standard. Do you care to speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I, I mean, and I want to be perfectly clear that it, obviously impeachment is not required or criminal liability is not required for an impeachment. And I know that and I know it's not treated the same way because there's nowhere else in any courtroom anywhere in the country where you would accuse somebody of a crime on a Wednesday, begin the prosecution on Tuesday before all the arrests have occurred, all the investigation is done. And it should be noted that there's two different schools of thought on whether you can impeach after somebody is out of office, but it has happened with a judge and I'm in the school that says you actually can. And there is plenty of time to do those things, but I mean, I don't know how you can impeach for and I just don't and how you can do it this quickly without any fact hearings and there is a real First Amendment question and there is one and there needs to be one. And we need to have that discussion because, as I said, I have been critical and I don't take those comments back um, about what happened and how it happened. But clearly, I mean, there, I mean, we also have to take, a, I think, a deep look at, I mean, we're setting a, a vague standard in these articles that has the ability to set some kind of precedent, one that I'm really afraid will outlast President Trump's final days. And I think Jonathan, for one, I've read so many articles in the last couple of days where guilt is, is not doubted and innocence is and never deliberated. And, and I spent 10 years as a criminal defense attorney. They, I would never have allowed this, I would never have allowed my clients to go through this kind of rough process. And if we're not gonna hold that standard accountable and do this in a deliberative fashion, I think we're doing an injustice to inst in an institution that people already have no confidence. I, um, look, I also agreed with your comments about the uh, <clears throat> both speakers made some uh, uh, assertions that this is a matter of such urgency that it has to be carried out right away. And yet the Democratic Whip has said that and we can hold on to these articles for a period of time, which then underlies or belies the urgency with, with which they're being brought to the floor. So we're urgently approaching a situation because we say it is so important. And then, in fact, we'll get around to it uh, when uh, someone decides at the time for proficiency. It just doesn't sound like that type of, of, of threat that you can I had to hold off on, on delivering the articles because it's inconvenient based on what else the Senate may have to do. Yeah, I agree with that. And to be clear, it sounds from everything I'm hearing like that is no longer the course of action. But there is also still talk. I mean, particularly when this is, I mean, any trial is going to occur after President Trump is left office and President Biden is in office. Well, I thank you for your participation uh, here this evening. Uh, the interest in the lateness of the hour, I'm going to yield back uh, the balance of my time. I, th I thank the uh, the gentleman. Um, let me just say, I think all the evidence we need to see, uh, we saw on January 6th. Uh, the whole world saw it. And what we're doing here today, essentially, is we're indicting the president, or, or we vote to, to move forward tomorrow. Um, and then, then the case will be heard over in the United States Senate. But we all talk about precedent. What is the precedent we're setting if we just turn a blind eye? We walk away from this. I, I, you know, maybe people have short memories. I was here uh, on Wednesday. Uh, I was in the chamber. 
when I walked out in the speaker's lobby, I mean, I, I saw that angry mob. These people were desecrating the citadel of freedom and, and democracy. I mean, it, and, it's, and it's almost as if we're trying to say, well, let's just let it go, let it go. Now, this is Donald being Donald. Well, this is another bizarre episode in a bizarre presidency. Give me a break. Honest to God, I mean, I, I mean, when is enough enough? Uh, and I, I, I give, you know, uh, Congresswoman Cheney and the other Republicans who are coming forward, including some of the Republicans in the Senate, who are, who are saying enough is enough. And this is not about political party. This is even about whether you like Donald Trump or not. This is about responding appropriately to one of the most egregious acts that any of us have ever seen in our lifetime uh, come from a White House. I now want to yield to the uh, uh, to uh, the general lady from uh, California, Ms. Torres. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is absolutely true that the future of our democracy it is is not guaranteed. Um, I can only point to the floor today and what is happening with our Republican colleagues challenging pushing through our Capitol Police because they refuse to abide by some basic safety principles. Where does it stop? Our democracy can and is being eroded, one corrupt act at a time. And until our democracy is a mere facade, the masks, the tyranny within, Mr. Chairman, right now, the tyranny isn't even masked. It's here inside these walls, using the American flag to attack, beat, and murder police officers who keep us safe. Today, we are conducting a somber but necessary business for the American people. The United States of America is at a crossroads. We've had four years of a brand of politics unlike any, any other in American history. A politics removed from facts, rooted in fear, reinforced online and broadcast to the masses through media outlets that were complicit in the lies. Last Wednesday, we saw firsthand where that path of mass misinformation leads. And it is shameful that it's continuing. It leads to violence. It leads to destruction and tragically to death. President Donald Trump incited the mob that stormed these halls. He did it in public view on a stage with television cameras capturing his every word. Using words like march on the Capitol and fight. Well, riot rioters did exactly what he told them to do. Some of our colleagues stood on that same stage and repeated very offensive remarks and lies. Five people died, including a Capitol Police officer. Another one killed himself. More than 50 police officers were seriously injured. 15 were injured so badly that they were hospitalized. All you have to do is walk by them to see the pain that they still have. Now I ask you, how can a man who would target our own Capitol ever safeguard our democracy? How can a man who frenzy a mob to overturn an election ever protect our constitution? How can a man who targeted our vice president, your vice president, our speaker, can ever be trusted with our safety? Well, let me tell you, he can't. He cannot. President Trump has done something no other president has ever attempted to do, something no other president would dare do. He incited a mob to attack his own people. 
and the democracy he swore an oath to defend. His behavior is deserving of an exceptional shame, and a second impeachment is exactly that. A private citizen has stood on a stage and said the things that he said to incite this mob into violence that caused the death of five people. That person would have been arrested. A vote for this article is a rejection of a politics of hate and division. It is a vote to ensure he never holds elected office again, ever. And it is a declaration to future generations that we did all we could to ensure that this democracy continue to thrive for future generations. So I will say again, we are at a crossroads and I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this article and support our democracy today. There is no Republican or Democrat. And when Democrats were crawling, trying to get to safety, and when they took us to a safe room, we were there together. This violent mob was incited by baseless claims that this election was stolen, claims that many of my colleagues have repeated over and over again. Let's discuss why the selection cycle is different. Congressman Raskin, where's the line between raising reasonable questions about the fairness of an election and what we have here today? Eight senators and 139 House members seemingly to this day are denying that Joe Biden is a duly elected president of the United States. What common thoughts do you have about that, Mr. Raskin? Um, thank you, Ms. Torres. And um, if, if this is an appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, for, for my remarks, could I? Could I incorporate an answer there? Does that make sense? Yeah, um, that's fine. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, I've been uh, moved by um, Ms. Torres's remarks and um, the moral seriousness and intensity with which our members are grappling with this unprecedented armed violent mob insurrection and attack against the government of the United States and the United States Congress. Um, and, um, you know, the, the mob that uh, killed several people was chanting, uh, hang Mike Pence for a long time. One officer said that that chant will be ringing in his ears for a long time. Um, they also were asking, where's Nancy? Apparently with the idea of uh, kidnapping her, holding her hostage, or worse. Um, they could have wiped out the line of uh, succession. And in fact, um, Senator Lindsey Graham, who obviously uh, thought himself a friend of the president's, at least up at these events, said, this mob could have blown the building up. They could have killed us all. And Ms. Torres is right to emphasize, it would have killed all of us, regardless of whether you're the biggest Trump supporter or the biggest Trump opponent in the world. This was an attack on the Congress of the United States of America. This was an attack on the people's house. It is constitutionally intolerable, unacceptable, and we must act. Um, and if this is not an impeachable event, then what is? If inciting a mob to insurrection against your own government yeah. is not an impeachable event, then what is? I want to quote- Mr. Raskin, if I may interrupt you for a minute. Yes. Um, I, I have to run to the floor to go vote. So uh, Mr. Chairman, when Mr. Raskin is finished, I will yield back to you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Torres. So I, I, I wanted to, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make a few points about what I've been able to hear. And as you know, I've been working on our resolution on the floor, which is why I had to miss part of today's extremely important Rules Committee uh, hearing uh, on the impeachment resolution. But um, Ms. Cheney um, from Wyoming, who is the outlarge congresswoman from Wyoming, and the chair of the House Republican Conference, which I think makes her the third ranking Republican, released an absolutely startlingly impressive statement today where she really reflected about what had just taken place in our country. And I wanna just quote a small part of it. It's not very long, but I do wanna quote it um, because it synthesizes so much of what I feel about our situation. And, and I don't know where Ms. Cheney is right now, but I wanna salute her for her uh, ethical seriousness and for her constitutional patriotism and for her love of her country. And she said, much more will become clear in coming days and, and weeks, but what we know now is enough. What we know now is enough, says Ms. Cheney. The president of the United States summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Everything that followed was his doing. None of this would have happened without the president. The president could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence. He did not. There has never been a greater betrayal by a president of the United States of his office and his oath to the Constitution. I will vote to impeach the president. That's Liz Cheney writing to her colleagues tonight. Um, all right, well, unfortunately I've got to go, but I, I want to just very quickly say, Mr. Armstrong in his comments confused the First Amendment Brandenburg standard for criminal prosecution of a citizen um, for his or her speech with the constitutional standards for impeaching a president for high crimes and misdemeanors against the Republic. Those are two completely different things. So that was totally disoriented on the law. It's also disoriented on the facts, because even if you were gonna to try to criminally prosecute the president for incitement, you'd likely get him on that. But that's not what we're doing. We have a much lower, lower standard here. The standard here is just, should a person who counsels, advises, encourages, and foments insurrection against our government continue as the president of the United States? The Brandenburg standard is an irrelevant distraction from what Congress needs to be thinking about. And if you have any doubts about that, read the statement of the American Civil Liberties Union. Mr. Romero, the executive director, just wrote a long analysis of why the ACLU board unanimously supports impeachment of a president who would betray his own democracy like this. And they say, again, the First Amendment has nothing to do with this because it is the speech of a government official and a completely different standard applies. And by the way, he's not being impeached for one speech. He's being impeached for an entire pattern of conduct for months, trying to undermine, nullify, and reverse the results of a democratic election. This is a fundamental betrayal of his oath of office. This president cannot stay in office, and we must act as a Congress to defend the Congress, the people, and the Constitution. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh Ms. Lesko. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to read um, an article by Jonathan Turley, who we heard from in the last impeachment uh, that was put forward. It was published in The Hill on January 9th, 2021. The author, Frank Kafka, once wrote, my guiding principle is this, Guilt is never to be doubted. Democrats suddenly appear close to adopting that standard into the Constitution as they prepare for a second impeachment of President Trump. With seeking his removal for incitement, Democrats would get not only the impeachment standard, but also free speech, all in a mad rush to remove Trump just day be days before his term ends. Democrats are seeking to remove Trump on the basis of his remarks to supporters before the rioting at the Capitol. Like others, I condemned those remarks as he gave them, calling them reckless and wrong. 
I also oppose the challenges to electoral votes in Congress. Again, this is from Jonathan Turley. But his address does not meet the definition for incitement under the criminal code. It would be viewed as protected speech by the Supreme Court. When I testified in the impeachment hearings of Trump and Bill Clinton, I noted that an article of impeachment does not have to be based on any clear crime, but that Congress has looked to the criminal code to weigh impeachment offenses. For this controversy now, any such comparison would dispel claims of criminal incitement. Despite broad and justified condemnation of his words, Trump never actually called for violence or riots but he urged his supporters to march on the Capitol to raise their opposition to the certification of electoral votes and to back the recent challenges made by a few members of Congress. Trump told the crowd to peacefully and patriotically make your voices be heard. These kinds of legal challenges have been made by Democrats in the past under the electoral count vote. And so Trump was pressing Republicans in Congress to join the effort on his behalf. He ended his remarks by saying a protest at the Capitol was meant to provide Republicans, quote, the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country, unquote. He told the crowd, quote, let us walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, unquote. Moreover, marches are common across the country to protest actions by the government. The legal standard for violent speech is found with Clarence Brandenburg versus Ohio. As a, free speech, as a free speech advocate, I criticized that 1969 case and its dangerously vague standard. But even if it would treat the remarks of Trump as protected under the First Amendment, with that case, the government is able to criminalize speech directed to inciting or producing eminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. There was no call for lawless action by Trump. Instead, there was a call for a protest at the Capitol. Moreover, violence was not eminent, as the vast majority of the tens of thousands of protesters were not violent before the march, and most did not riot inside the Capitol. Like many violent protests in the last four years, criminal conduct was carried out by a smaller group of instigators. Capitol Police knew of the march, but declined an offer from the National Guard since they did not view violence as likely. So Congress is now seeking an impeachment for remarks covered by the First Amendment. It would create precedent for the impeachment of any president blamed for violent acts of others after using reckless language. What is worse are those few cases that would support this type of action. The most obvious is the 1918 prosecution of socialist Eugene Debs, who spoke against the draft of World War I and led figures like Woodrow Wilson to declare him a traitor to the, his country. Debs was arrested and charged with sedition, a new favorite term for Democrats to denounce Trump and Republicans who doubted the victory of Joe Biden. In 1919, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote for a unanimous bench in one of the most infamous decisions to issue from the Supreme Court. It di dismissed the free speech rights for Debs and held it was sufficient that his words had the, quote, natural tendency and reasonably probable effect, unquote, of deterring people from supporting the international conflict. That decision was a disgrace. But Democrats are now arguing something even more extreme as the basis for impeachment. Under their theory, any president would be removed for rhetoric that is seen to have the natural tendency to encourage others to act in a riotous fashion. Even a call for supporters to protest peacefully could not be a defense. Such a standard would allow for a type of vicarious impeachment that attributes conduct of third parties to any president for the purposes of removal. Democrats are pushing this dangerously vague standard while objecting to their own remarks given new meaning from critics. Conservatives have pointed to Maxine Waters asking her supporters to confront Republicans in restaurants while Ayanna Presley insisted amidst the violent marches last year that, quote, there needs to be unrest in the streets, unquote. And Kamala Harris said, quote, protesters 
should not let up, unquote, even as some of those marches turn violent. They can legitimately argue their rhetoric was not meant to be a call for violence, but this standard is filled with subjectivity. The damage caused by the rioters this week was enormous. However, it will pale in comparison to the damage from a new precedent of a snap impeachment for speech protected under the First Amendment. It is the very threat that the framers sought to avoid in crafting the impeachment standard in a process of deliberative judgment. The reference to a snap impeachment is a contradiction. In this new system, guilt is not doubted and innocence is not deliberated. This would do the Constitution, this would do to the Constitution what the violent rioters did to the Capitol and leave it in tatters. Um, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert this uh, article from Jonathan Turley into the record. Without objection. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you. Um, I, just, I, I just need to respond. Um, what happened in the Capitol uh, on Wednesday is a little bit different from somebody's dinner being disturbed at a restaurant. People died. Uh, there was an attempt to launch a coup to prevent Congress from doing its constitutional, fulfilling its constitutional responsibility. I mean, this was an insurrection. And, you know, to be honest with you, you know, you may have interpreted his words one way, but clearly that mob interpreted it quite differently. Uh, and when you talk about Donald Trump using the word peacefully, that was after he got caught. That was not before the march. That was after all hell broke loose. That was, uh, that was after somebody handed him a prepared statement to read because things were so out of control. He said, fight like hell. Rudy Giuliani talked about trial by combat. I mean, let's, let's be very clear about what happened at that rally and what the result was. Mr. Chair. Yes, I, yeah, I, I recognize the gentlewoman from uh, Arizona. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was reading um, an, an article written by Jonathan Turley, and so that was my full reading, exactly what he wrote. But, um, Mr. Well, that, Chairman, I, I, yeah. my criticism is for Jonathan Turley then. <laughs> but, um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would encourage you to read the transcript from the speech. I read it. Um, and in fact, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I just want to set this for the record. I'm not trying to be argumentative. I just want to say this is exactly from the transcript. It says, we have come to, this is what Donald Trump said during his speech. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated, lawfully slated. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. And this was 18 minutes and 16 seconds into the speech. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And, and uh, there's there's a big a lot of chunks of that speech missing. But in any event, I yield to Mr. Cicil I, I yield to Mr. Cicilline. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I just might respond briefly. First of all, it's really important to say, and I think Mr. Raskin articulated this just a moment ago. This First Amendment claim is completely specious. It's it's a silly argument. The, the private citizens have a First Amendment right that is to protect them from government interference in their free speech. Government officials are in a very different position. Brandenburg has nothing to do with the impeachment of a president. And this president uh, made a series of statements and took a series of actions that incited this insurrection. The First Amendment has nothing to do with this analysis. Secondly, um, impeachments are not about punishing people for a crime. It's about the preventing future danger. The impeachment of the president is to remove the president from office because of the danger he presents currently. And finally, there is a First Amendment exception, even if it did apply to the to the president, which it does not, uh, for incitement. And then finally, uh, I know uh, Ms. Mrs. Esco made reference to the notion of that yeah, this is you know impeaching the president for a speech, as is detailed in the impeachment report. 
th this president's incitement was much more than a speech. This was an ongoing campaign to promote a lie that he had won the election and it was stolen from him, despite the fact he won by tens of millions of votes. And he riled up his supporters and told them that they had to come to Washington to fight and fight hard to take back the country or they wouldn't have a country anymore. There was wide public reporting that this group was descending on the Capitol at the president's urging to stop the steal, as he said, and that they were armed and they were dangerous and that violence was likely. And with all of that knowledge, the president continued to promote the big lie, and that morning was the icing on the cake. He riled them up, reminding them of the big lie, telling they wouldn't have a country if they didn't fight, fight, fight. Rudy Giuliani talked about combat. Donald Trump Jr. said, we're coming for you. These all contributed to the incitement, and the president, after it happened, didn't immediately call a press conference and say, stop the violence. Public reporting is he was delighted by it because it had stopped the electoral college process. He was pleased by that. And then he made statements saying, this is what you get um, when you steal or take away an election. And so we still haven't seen a president who, who has shown remorse, who understands the gravity of this insurrection and continues to present a great danger. So it's not a single speech. It's not one phrase. It was feeding the lie every day for weeks and weeks and weeks to enrage his supporters and make them believe their their votes had been stolen away and that they had to fight like they've never fought before to take back their democracy. That's what incited the violence, which was the inevitable result of Donald Trump's ongoing campaign to get people to come to Washington and disrupt the Electoral College and attack the Capitol. And I thank the gentleman for the yielding. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield to Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Cicilline just uh, did a great job explaining what this is all about. And I thank him for that. I thank him for his work on, on this. Uh, I mean, the bottom line, and I'd say to my friend, Mr. Armstrong, and I want to thank you, uh, sir, for standing up for the Constitution uh, last week and uh, affirming and confirming uh, the electoral college votes. You and a number of other Republicans, uh, and I'm sure you're taking some uh, grief. Uh, people are complaining to you about that, but I do appreciate that. I disagree, however, with how you've described this, and I appreciate that you were a defense lawyer. And I would say to my friend, Mr. Cole, I see him sitting down. The flaw that is the flaw of your logic, uh, Mr. Armstrong, and Mr. Cole's lo logic, because you say a lot of things that I would agree with, except this is to prevent future behavior. This isn't looking, you know, it isn't looking back and we're trying a particular case. The best evidence of what you're going to do in the future is what you did in the past. And what we, this is more like a domestic kind of a situation where you want to make sure that the that there is protection. You know, the old says to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, and the president didn't do any of that in this particular instance. You know, do we want to be proceeding with an impeachment with eight days left? Hell no. That isn't something we want to do. We want to have the peaceful transition. We would like to get this Finished, we want Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to be sworn in. But there are threats that have surfaced for next week, similar to the threats that occurred last week. And we need to make sure that there's somebody who wants to preserve, protect, and defend. And, you know, Mike Pence and I served together. And I have to say, I appreciated the way he conducted himself. He was threatened to be hanged. I think the only thing I would say to my friend, Mr. Armstrong, that makes all of this difficult, is that each and every one of us is a witness, and each and every one of us is a victim of what occurred last week. And each and every one of us has a responsibility to do whatever we can to make sure it doesn't happen again next week and that there is a transition of government. And so I appreciate the argument my friend makes. I appreciate 
what Mr. Cole said, but it doesn't deal with preventing something going on in the future. And uh, with that, I yield back to the chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reichenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It took me a second to unmute there. I appreciate it. Um, I was just gonna, going to see, I, uh, I see my friend, uh, Kelly Armstrong, uh, frantically writing. So I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Is there anything that you wanted to uh, want to discuss that you feel that wasn't, wasn't brought up? I know people have been talking about your arguments. So I, I just wanted to give you a chance, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, and to Mr. Prometter, I don't particularly disagree with some of that, other than I would argue that no matter what we do here today, and no matter what we do on the floor, Donald Trump is still going to be the president until January 20. And if you're worried, really worried about this institution and the process, and, I, and we were all victims, and we were all witnesses, and when emotions are high and tensions are as frayed as they are, that's when process matters the most. It really is. And so if you're worried about future conduct and you're worried about the integrity of this, and more importantly, if you're worried about a, a vast majority of Trump supporters, particularly when we're not doing this in a vacuum, uh, I sat through the last impeachment. I sat through the year of it. So why wouldn't we do the process? I mean, it, and that also goes to Mr. Chairman, the answer isn't doing this or doing nothing. That has never been the answer. And if that's what some of my colleagues are arguing, they're not going to get support from me either. So um, I want to be clear about that. But this institution matters. Due process always matters. Fairness always matters. And if we're going to prevent future conduct when the president is going to be the president until January 20th, no matter what we were doing here, we should do this. We should have hearings. We should have, if, if we're going down this path and if this is the path we're going down, and we should do it the way the institution and as the deliberative body is supposed to be. And with that, thanks, Mr. Reschenthal. Thanks, Mr. Armstrong. I appreciate it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Thank you. Ms. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard suggestions here that there's a due process element that the, the House has to engage in, and, and that's not a new argument. Uh, Ms. Lesko mentioned uh, Jonathan Turley, who was the president's defender in the impeachment hearings. But I've just been looking as we've been speaking um, at a book by Michael Gerhardt, who was one of the majority witnesses. And he talks about this idea of deep due process in, in impeachment hearings and really comes to the conclusion that, you know, because uh, impeachment is at the sole discretion of the House and the House has um, the authority to write its own rules, but that's what happens. There's basically plenary discretion to figure out how to conduct each impeachment. There was no fact finding by the House in the Clinton impeachment. Um, each impeachment has adjusted to its time, shall we say. And, and to those who are saying that this is a snap impeachment, if we actually go through with impeachment tomorrow, it will have been a week since the riots were caused by the president. Um, Andrew Johnson was impeached in three days. Okay. It took the house three days to impeach him. And in that one, there was no fact finding either because like this situation, the house had the evidence it needed in, in that instance, they impeached him because he dismissed the secretary of war and sent a letter to the house to inform the house that that had happened. So here. You know, the president kind of sent the evidence right into our laps as people, you know, on this meeting had to uh, leave the chair abruptly, had to shelter in place, had to barricade themselves in various places and heard what the mob did. We also saw and we've heard since then that the president has expressed no remorse that he did not uh, send assistance to the Capitol to the first branch or the first article branch of the government. Um, so we have the evidence to impeach. Now there is a trial where due process can occur and that's going to be in the Senate. And if the Senate chooses not to take it up before uh, the inauguration, we can't control that, but we can do our duty and say, this is wrong. We do think there is more than sufficient evidence and we can go through the due process required by this house. So I, I don't think it's too fast. I think that is the point of this impeachment um, because of the clear and present danger of what can happen in the next few days with an unrepentant president whose followers are still 
supporting him still fomenting insurrection. Um, Mr. Cicilline, did you have any comments on due process? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kenlin. I, I, I concur with your assessment. I, I think there's a big distinction between this impeachment and the prior impeachment of President Trump. The first is that prior impeachment involves a secret conspiracy and a plot that required uh, uncovering of evidence. Um, and also, the president was sort of um, presented some danger in the in the earlier impeachment, but it was sort of a creeping and slow uh, danger. This case, the president's remaining in office is a clear and present danger today, right now, every day he remains in office to the well-being of the American people, to the safety and security of our government, and to the national security and system of this country. As Ms. Galen said, there are no facts in dispute. Uh, unlike the last impeachment, the facts played out before millions of Americans on television uh, as the president in, incited an insurrection against the government and his uh, these domestic terrorists traveled up to the Capitol, stormed the Capitol, looking to lynch the vice president, assassinate the speaker, hunt down members of Congress, do incredible damage uh, where five people died, including one Capitol police officer and dozens of law enforcement officers were injured, as well as significant damage to the citadel of democracy. So people saw all of this play out. They saw all of the statements and tweets and speeches of the president promoting the big lie, getting his uh, supporters to be furious, to believe they've been cheated or an election has been stolen from them, and then a call to action to not take it anymore. You won't have a country to go up there and fight, fight, fight. I think you used the word fight 23 times that morning. That was just the culmination of an ongoing effort to get his supporters to come to Washington to support his Stop the Steal event. He tweeted that so that he would stop the peaceful transition of power. So there's no dispute about any of this. This all happened before our eyes, and members of Congress were victims or witnesses to all of these events. And finally, I would just note that we provided the president with the opportunity to present witnesses and testify in his last impeachment proceeding, which he declined. So the notion that he suddenly would want to do that, but as Ms. Scanlon said, due process rights attach at trial. That's when you have a right to call witnesses, cross-examination of witnesses, present evidence, present documents. The impeachment is the indictment. It's the accusation of the president. Those full panoply of due process rights don't attach, don't attach to an indictment in any event. Uh, but I would say, finally, to return to my first point, this is urgent. We don't have the, the luxury of time because this president with no remorse, with an ongoing effort to undermine our democracy and undermine the electoral results remains a clear and present danger to the well-being of this democracy and to our country. And he must be removed from office immediately. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, steadfast leadership uh, today and every day, and I know this is a remarkable day, uh, but just uh, want you to know how much I appreciate you. And thank you, Mr. Cicilline, for uh, your leadership and your authorship of the resolution and, and for all the work you do, tireless work you do on behalf of our country. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the members of this committee find ourselves yet again with a somber obligation before us, and I wanted to just take a moment to sort of express my thoughts on this, and I'll be repeating some of what my colleagues have said, but I wanted to lay out at least how I think about this in what is uh, the first time in the history of our republic where we face the decision to impeach a sitting president for the second time, and none of us take any joy or um, uh, any good feelings away from this. This is something to reflect on, and as everyone has said, this isn't a political decision. We The political decision was made on uh, November 3rd by um, the millions of Americans. Um, and so while I'm heartbroken for our nation that it has to come to this, we have a constitutional duty to hold the president accountable for his actions. The events of the past week remain shocking, emotional, and painful for us as individuals as well as as a nation. And the violent attack on January 6th led to the deaths of five Americans and the desecration of a building that is the very symbol of our democracy, a sacred space that represents the rule of law, the voice of the people, and the fundamental values we hold dear. Most shocking of all, it was incited by the president himself to undermine and disrupt the counting of votes that will bring to a close his presidency. And Donald Trump's actions and rhetoric clearly demonstrate, demonstrate he's unfit for the presidency. 
I want to repeat what you said just uh, some time earlier this afternoon, Mr. Chairman, that yes. last week we each took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and in doing so to protect the American people from clear and present danger. That danger confronts us now, this moment, a dark, insidious, grave danger that threatens the foundation and the people of this grand republic. To thwart this very real hazard, President Trump must be removed from office using any means afforded to us by the Constitution. There can be no question that a president who not only abdicates his responsibility to protect his country, but instead incites violence against it, who not only refuses to forcefully condemn those who seek to overthrow our government, but actively encourages them, who time and time again calls upon our nation's darkest demons instead of summoning our better angels. And there can be no question that surely such a president is exactly the type of unchecked executive that our founders had in mind when they entrusted the House of Representatives with the power of impeachment in the first place. Our president wants us here, the rioters and insurrectionists said, as they violently sought to take over the seat of our government. They firmly believed, and he led them to believe, that they were fighting for him. In fact, he told them directly, minutes before the attack on the Capitol, after this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you, although he was not. And they believe that because they have repeatedly been lied to and egged on by a leader who cares more about the preservation of his power and his office than our national interests. The president directed them, you have to show strength. You have to be strong. After the mob attacked Capitol Police officers using the American flag as a weapon, the president said, as Mr. Cicilline has reminded us, we love you, you're very special. That was after the incident, not before. Sorry, you can talk all you want about the things he said on the ellipse before the rioters came to attack the Capitol. He said that after, with the full knowledge of what had happened. In any other period, we would find the president's behavior outside the bounds of moral and decent behavior. But we've become almost numb to it. It has, for some, become normalized. But let's acknowledge it. The rhetoric that led to this violence did not begin recently, nor is it poised to end. The president has continually reveled in the support he receives from the worst factions of America, who spout hatred, and he has repeatedly refused to condemn the violence of neo-Nazis, white supremacists and anti-democratic traitors. We teach our children that words matter, but it is a lesson that gets harder and harder to teach when time and time again, it is willfully defied by the leader of the highest office in our land. So let's come together to make it clear to our children, our grandchildren, and to the generations to follow that Donald Trump's behavior is antithetical to American law, American democracy, and American values. We must make it clear to this president and to all future presidents that we cannot and will not tolerate actions that endanger, in the words of Jefferson, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all Americans. And through all of this, let's ensure one thing remains clear to our country and to those watching around the globe. Our democracy is strong. It may bend, but it will not break, and we're testament to that tonight. Um, Mr. Chairman, as I close, I'm reminded that those of us entrusted with the safety and security of our nation a good conscience, President Kennedy wisely observed, is our only sure reward. In history, will be the final judge of our deeds. My friends, the time of good conscience is now. Let's act in defense of our nation, support this resolution, and earn the approving final judgment of history. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I, I, you know, I'm just looking at my Hollywood Squares display here, and I noticed Mr. Cole is there, and I didn't know whether you wanted me to, you, you wanted any time? No, Mr. Chairman, I'm fine. I'm enjoying the discussion. All right, thank you. All right, um, I'm, I'd now like to yield to Mr. Desagne. You need to unmute. Mark. Yep. Unmute, okay. You got Miss Ross's microphone. 
Okay, wh why don't we why don't we go to Ms. Ross, then we'll come back to Mr. Desagne. Uh, we can figure out his the, the sound stuff. So Ms. Ross? Yes, can you hear me? Did my mic work this time? Yay, I'm learning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you very much, uh, Congressman Cicilline, for bringing this forward. Um, we've talked a lot about the horrible, horrible events um, that happened here at the Capitol on January 6th. And um, I want to end with that, but really start with the beginning of this president um, violating the law and urging others to violate the law in order to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. Because he was working on that before January the 6th. He was working on that in Georgia to try to have elections officials um, and elected officials find votes for him, illegally find votes for him. That was asking people to violate their oaths. That was asking people to violate the law so that he could prevent the peaceful transfer of power to President-elect Biden and uh, Vice President-elect Harris. Well, that didn't work. So then what did he do? He tried to get the vice president to go against his duty under the Constitution in reporting on the electors. And the vice president, to his great credit, refused to do it because he knew that that would be violating his oath and violating the law. After both of those things failed, he told a mob, and it was a mob because we saw them when they came into the Capitol and as they were around the Capitol, that it was up to them to save his presidency, to save the country and have them engage in illegal actions. Three things, three things that resulted in the desecration of this capital, that resulted in the loss of life, that threatened so many people's lives and put people in the hospital, and he still has no remorse. If that is not, if those three things and that culmination do not rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors, I just don't know what does. And as Mr. Cicilline has said, what the House is doing here is not holding the trial. This is an indictment. This is presenting the evidence that would go to try. And unfortunately, we're at this point because the president has not admitted that he's done anything wrong through this entire pattern. And unfortunately, the vice president has said this evening he will not invoke the 25th Amendment. So what is left? The only thing that is left is the authority of this House to indict the president for this pattern of inciting law lawlessness, not just the violence that we saw here on the 6th, but lawlessness all the way along after he lost an election. That cannot be in a democracy. That cannot be under our Constitution. We must impeach this president. I am so happy that Congresswoman Cheney has agreed and has taken a very bold and brave stance. It is our duty to do this. And I thank Mr. Cicilline for bringing this forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll go to Mr. Desagne. Can you hear us? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry about that. I, I, just, want, I just want to say you, you, you got a promotion and you still left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm still a Charlie Brown of your committee. Um, well, I just, that's what I get for using a Texas company's uh, computer. I switch back to my California company. Um, I, I just want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman and uh, the ranking member and Mr. Cicilline um, and uh, all of my colleagues for the comments. Um, and just reiterate what I said earlier, I suppose, is uh, struck by um, Lincoln said that nations don't die from external invasion. They die from internal uh, rottenness. And I think all of us can agree that what happened in the Capitol building um, last Wednesday was about as rotten as we would ever want to see, particularly of Americans. Uh, but I don't, uh, I, I don't I don't see how you can separate uh, the president's actions for what we saw in that building. Um, and I've tried to uh, understand your perspective. Um, it comes across to me, quite frankly, as not just op op obfuscation or deflection, but um, a denial. Uh, and I would hope that if I was in a position um, where President of my party behave like this. Um, I wouldn't feel that way with all due respect. So I, I think we have to do what we have in front of us. And I'm happy to support uh, this resolution. I'm thankful it's in front of us. I'm not happy the country has to go through this, but after what's happened, I don't see how we can't uh, take the actions that we took earlier today um, and we are being asked to take today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman goes back. Does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question of this panel? Seeing none, let me let me uh, take this opportunity to thank um, Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Cicilline for coming before the Rules Committee and, and making the case. We appreciate uh, your time and obviously your passion on these issues. And uh, since there are no more questions, you you are now excused. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, we now have a, a, another panel, uh, and I would like to welcome uh, the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Green. Make sure I, we have him here. I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Okay, there you are. Okay, yes, it's, it's great to see you. Um, uh, thank you for providing testimony today. Any written materials that you submit to rules documents at mail house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will without objection be entered into the record. And I'm now uh, uh, very happy to recognize the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank all of the members of the committee. I thank you for allowing me to listen earlier to all of the various testimony and to the comments made by the members of the committee, it's been very enlightening. I came prepared to talk about Federalist 65, about Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Green, if I could just pause you for a second. Um, your, your volume is coming over pretty low, so I don't know whether if you speak closer to the mic, uh, just because I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me well now? Is that better? I see you nodding, thank you. As I said, I came to talk about uh, Federalist 65 in Hamilton. I was preparing myself for a scholarly debate uh, to talk about Andrew Johnson, 1868, more specifically Article 10 of those Articles of, of Impeachment and the requirements for impeachment. But candidly speaking, after listening to you, I've you've softened my heart to the extent that I want to talk about what this is really about now. This is really about hate. This is about hate. That's what my amendment is about. It's about hate. All of this that we saw was motivated by hate. 
And many of you have said as much. So I'm merely echoing what you've said. It's about insidious prevarication. It's about the ability to manipulate people and weaponize hate. So I want you to know that uh, I too am worried about future. I'm worried about the future that will allow another Donald Trump to believe that he too can weaponize hate and use it as it was used against us here. But I'm also worried about a lot of people who don't have the protections that I have. I'm worried about people who tell me that they're living in fear now, that they're afraid. I'm worried about the people who can recall what happened in uh, Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street. People who understand what happened in Rosewood, Florida. If that mob decides that they want to attack a community, there are a good many people who believe that it will be a community of color. So I'm worried about the hate and the fear that people have that don't have the benefits that I have. When I go through an airport and they verbally assault me, police officers protect me. But there are people who have to suffer the consequences of hate that don't have the protection that we have. We, we have a metal detector now. You go into the floor, members are searched. We are protected. So I'm here tonight to appeal to you to just vote. Let people vote. Let them vote on these amendments, both of them. Vote here to let people vote on the floor. This is a challenge for both sides. The First Amendment, I'm supporting it. And I think a good many of you will. But the question is, do you have the courage to support the Second Amendment? So by way of further introduction of this, let me tell you this, and I, I promise I won't be long, but I want to tell you this uh, by way of further introduction. I know what this kind of hate looks like. I've had a cross burned in my yard. I know what this kind of hate sounds like. I've been called ugly names. I'm 73 years old. But I want to share the vignette so that you'll understand how I much understand what it feels like. On Christmas morning, a young child received the gift that he had been pleading for and was hoping that Santa would bring. It was a red bicycle. This young child, like all children, wanted to get out and have a great experience with this bicycle. So as he was riding his bicycle, past a wooded area, he felt some stinging, first on an arm, then the face, and it became even more intense. And he could hear a popping sound. And then some young boys stood up and talked about how I got him. No, I got him, I hit him first. And they had what you and I would call BB guns, but they called them the N-word shooters. N-word shooters. I was the target. Young boy, new bicycle for Christmas, rushing home to his parents, afraid to go back out on his bicycle. Some of us have lived through some things that cause us to understand why we have to deal with the hate. This is not something that I know vicariously. This is something that I know intimately. So I'm appealing to you. Vote yes on the Second Amendment as well. Let it go to the floor. There is this indisputable fact. While you may not agree with Gerald Ford, he said impeachment is whatever Congress says it is. I, I don't necessarily agree with him myself. But this is indisputable. If you vote 
to allow it to go to the floor. And if the floor votes to impeach, it's not appealable. So to a certain extent, Ford is right. But I happen to think there's more to it than what he said. So I beseech you, I implore you, I appeal to you. Give the second amendment that I've given to you a chance because there are many people who will benefit from it that you'll never meet and greet because we will label this president for what he is. We will label him for what he is, a person who has weaponized hate, and there are many other adjectives, but who's weaponized hate, and he's used that for advantage. Let's send a message to the future. This is a seminal moment in time that will impact the rest of time. And these moments in time require courage. So I beg of you, just let the floor vote on both of these amendments. History will reward all of us well. I'm going to support the first one. And I believe that if you support the second, the people that tell me they're living in fear will at least have some additional hope. I, I appreciate the gentleman's uh, statement. I appreciate him sharing his perspective. I, I uh, admire the gentleman greatly. I, I think he's one of the wisest people in the Congress. And um, and he was uh, he demonstrated courage on this issue that we're talking about here today earlier than anybody. Um, and so I um, I uh, I want to. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that, um, um, Mr. Mr. Cole. Always good to hear from my friend, but I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Torres. I have no questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Lesko. No questions, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Reschenthaler? No questions, Mr. Chairman. I lost, almost lost my iPad there. No questions, but thank you. Uh, Ms. Scanlon? No, thank you. Thank you, Representative Green. Mr. Morelli? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Desagne? No, Mr. Chairman, I'm good. Ms. Ross? Uh, no questions. Okay. Mr. Green, I, um, hey, 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 hey! Oh, I, I, no, I, 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 I lost Perlmutter. I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Green uh, <laughs> for his amendment, and actually, there are a number of things in his amendment that go to the overall article of impeachment, uh, uh, similar to what Ms. Ross said, leading up uh, to January sixth, and and there are a number of um, tweets at, that he has. Uh, listed and and flyers and all that leading up to uh, january 6th uh, as part of uh, his amendment i just want to thank the gentleman for uh, joining us tonight I yield back and let me apologize to mr perlmutter i it was not intentional that i passed you over <laughs> uh yeah that's what we all believe i was going to ask unanimous consent we might do it on a regular basis though uh, second but uh but uh Mr. Green, uh, uh, I, I'm so glad that you're part of this uh, House of Representatives. I appreciate you, your passion on this issue and your dedication on this issue. And um, and uh, and what you said today resonates uh, with many with a lot of us. So I thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions for Mr. Green, you're excused. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. And I, I just we now have. A, I've been informed we have another panel. Uh, the general lady, I want to recognize the general lady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, who I think it's your, her, your birthday today. It is. Thank you. Uh, and for that reason, I will uh, give myself a birthday gift and uh, be uh, succinct on this uh, presentation. And I thank the Rules Committee for uh, its leadership. Uh, let me begin by saying the words of the framers uh, and to reflect on where we are today with respect to the 
uh, insurrection, the attack by domestic terrorists provoked by the president of the United States. Um, it was the framers of the constitution that said uh, regarding the president, um, whose character is thus marked, meaning the president by every act, which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. As we have looked at impeachments from Andrew Johnson, uh, continuing to Richard Nixon and two presidents in the last 20 years, those presidents preceding this present impeachment were not impeached on insurrection and sedition and maybe even treason. Just think of that. And so in this instance, this impeachment becomes unique because the facts clearly point to the acts of insurrection, the acts of provoking a mob to attack this democratic symbol. I introduce HRES 26, which speaks to the insurrection, but it also has Article 2, which speaks to the question of abuse of power, the failure to defend the Constitution, and it highlights the fact that it failed to defend duly elected, federally elected persons, um, such as uh, members of Congress, the Speaker, and the Senate leadership. I am supporting my colleague, Mr. Cicilline, in his Article 1 uh, for HRES 24. But I wanted to indicate that HRES 26 uh, provides the framework of the abuse that Mr. Trump has continued from the moment of his inauguration. Lives started with the numbers of people who came to his inauguration. This is a historical moment, and much more will be said on the floor of the House. But I did want to offer to the Rules Committee uh, if uh, the HRES was to be amended, the idea of the failure to defend the Constitution along with the insurrection, and of course, the enormous abuse of power uh, and the framing of this mob attack from November 6 by the constant insinuating and saying that the election was stolen, fueling the fires of those who had both a racist tendencies, who could utilize this as an opportunity for their violence, and then those who would not take the democratic process of winning and losing elections as finality, but wanted to take these issues and turn them violently on innocent persons on January 6, 2021. So again, um, I offer consideration HRS 26, but I rise as well to support my friend, fellow colleague on the Judiciary Committee, HRS 24, and I thank the Rules Committee uh, for its uh, commitment and service for us to begin to hold uh, the present president of the United States for the first time in history accountable on horrific acts of insurrection and incitement that perpetrated danger uh, and a clear danger to the United States and loss of life of Americans whose families I offer my deepest sympathy, including the loss of life of our Capitol Hill police officer in the line of duty as he was uh, suffered injuries, engaged with the mob, and then tragically, an additional officer who lost his life as well. Thank you for your time. And with that, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member and members, I yield back. I thank the gentlewoman for her, her testimony. I always enjoy listening to her perspective on a whole range of issues. Um, and her expertise on all matters related to the judiciary. And so I have no questions. Does uh, Mr. Cole, do you have any questions or? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I do not. But uh, again, always a delight to see my good friend from Texas before the committee. 
Does anyone on the panel have a question for Ms. Jackson Lee? Apparently there are none, so I, uh, I, I, Mr. I Mr. Chairman, it's yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, it's me again. Yes. I, just, I, just wanted, I just wanted to wish my colleague a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that at this late hour. You're, you're, you're welcome. I yield back. I, 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 I'd, sing, I'd sing, but it would ruin your birthday. So <laughs> we'll do it another time. Yeah. So I would, I would like to thank our witness for her testimony, and you're now excused. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you to the Rules Committee. Are there any other members who wish to testify in HRS 24? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on HRS 24. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Torres. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant HRS 24 impeaching Donald John Trump, President of the United States for High Crimes and Misdemeanors, a closed rule. The rule provides two hours of debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees. The rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the resolution. The rule provides that until completion of proceedings enabled by the first section of the resolution, the chair may decline to entertain any intervening motion, resolution, question, or notice and the chair may decline to entertain the question of consideration. The rule provides that upon adoption of HRS 24, HRS 40 is hereby adopted and no other resolution incidental or impeachment relating to HRS 24 shall be privileged during the remainder of the 117th Congress. Finally, the rule provides that HRS 8 agreed to January 4th 2021 is amended by striking January 28th, each place that it appears and inserting February 11th. You've heard the motion from the gentleman from California. Uh, is there any amendment or discussion? Hearing none. Um, the question is now on the motion offered by the gentlewoman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 No. no. All, those, all those opposed say no. No. <laughs> no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. That uh, sounded surprisingly close to me. So uh, we're going to go ahead and ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays have been requested. Um, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Raskin. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Desonier. Aye. Mr. Desonier. Aye. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess. No. Mrs. Lesko. No. Mrs. Lesko. No. Mr. Reschenthaler. No. Mr. Reschenthaler. No. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Clerk report the total. Seven yeas, four nays. The motion is agreed to. Um, accordingly, I will manage it for the majority. And uh, I will manage it for the Republicans, Mr. Chairman. And let me let me just close by uh, by thanking everybody uh, for um, a, a, a long. I'm, I'm being told to hold for one second here. You still don't have, we still don't have it. It's a problem. They didn't provide you guys with the rule before they exposed. 
We could do it again. You know, if uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'll call it nine to four, I'm willing to concede that's an accurate count. Uh, I um, I uh, I'm just I'm just trying to get clarification whether we need to do this vote again. So, yeah. Well, we'll do whatever, obviously, right. whatever you think uh, we need to do. In the meantime, while we're trying to figure that out, let me let me thank everybody for your patience today. Let me, in particularly, thank the staff, both the majority and the minority staff. Um, this is um, this has been a hellish week for all of us. It has been particularly difficult on the staff, um, and um, and I, I think we all acknowledge their contribution, and we are all very sensitive to what they've been through. I mean, we are we are having this this rules committee meeting in the United States Capitol building, which essentially is a is a crime scene. And um, so it's been a very, very challenging week for everybody. And I know this is not a pleasant topic for us to be dealing with. So I'm just, I just want to get that on the record. And um, I'm just waiting to make sure that we are we're clear here. Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, you're beginning to eat into my cigar time now. I know, I'm sorry. You're getting very serious. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Reschenthaler, I thought I would uh, bring him down to 152 for a celebratory uh, first uh, Rules Committee cigar. So, so he's I'm not the only, the only member anxious to go. He's going to don't. realize that this Kimmy is, is not all that bad. So, in any event, um, I think we're, I think, I think I've been told we're all set. And so I apologize. Uh, and, and, uh, oh, and so Sharon, the ice have it, the motion is agreed to. I will handle it for the uh, majority. And Mr. Cole, you'll do it for the minority. I will. And Mr. Chairman, may I just say, uh, since I invited the guy to have a cigar, if there's anybody else that happens to be around, cares to join us, you are all more than welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, without objection, the committee is adjourned.